share your knowledge and your insights with us. And a special thank to you. I would also like to extend a special welcome to those of you representing the Riksbank itself. Welcome home. I could say that because given that the West Wing of the Swedish Parliament once served as the home of the Riksbank, and it did so for several years. For natives and visitors alike, the two buildings on this island, rising between the royal castle and the governmental buildings, constitute a beautiful view since the beginning of the last century. But the Riksdag was reformed into a unicameral parliament needing new premises, and the Riksbank had to leave us in 1976. However, the period when we, so to speak, lived together is still a part of our daily life. For example, when you pass through the main entrance, you come in to the beautiful Bank Hall, as it is still known today. We may have separated physically since then, but there is still a strong link between us since the Riksbank is a public authority under the Swedish parliament, the Riksdag. We have played different roles in society during the centuries, and I'm sure that the relationship between the Riksdag and the Riksbank will continue to evolve accordingly. 350 years of history is not only something to be proud of, but also something to reflect upon. 350 years is a very long period of time. Just imagine the enormous institutional memory contained within Central Bank, the world's oldest Central Bank. Consider the experience gained after 350 years of handling financial crisis. It feels seriously mentioned, we have gathered to discuss Central Banks in the past, present and future. But we must not forget that this day also is an occasion to celebrate the 350th anniversary of the oldest central bank in the world. With that said, I will now open the floor to the chairperson of the General Council of the Riksbank, Susanne Gjertsberg. Thank you. Honorable participants, Honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, right from the start in 1668, the Riksbank was placed under the sole authority of the Riksdag. So monetary policy has been under the control of representatives elected by Swedish people for 350 years. For the Riksbank, it is also important that our anniversary is being celebrated today together with our principal, the Riksdag. The bank's independence from the executive power runs like a common thread through history, even if on several occasions throughout this past 350 years it has not always been self-evident. It's also pleasing that alongside representatives from the Riksdag, the government, Swedish authorities and the business sector, we also have so many representatives here from central banks all around the world and from other international institutions and organizations. Together with you, we want to use this day to highlight and celebrate the central bank that has remained stable for 350 years. But will this stability be maintained future, in the future, and will the Riksbank be able to renew itself in the future to meet the challenges that await? This morning we have heard a number of ex exciting reflections about the role of central banks and the challenges they face. My guess is that this afternoon's presentations and discussions will be just as exciting as we now hear about what we can learn from the history of central banking and what the future will in, and what the future holds for central banks. Welcome to this afternoon's proceeding. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, Urban Alin, and Chairperson Susan Epstein for those welcoming words. And as Chairperson Epstein, you said this morning we had some interesting discussions on the role of central banks and the challenges they are facing now and in the future. And this afternoon we will continue uh, these discussions. First, practical information. I would like to inform you that uh, uh, the conference is being filmed and broadcast live on the website of both the Riksbank and the Rikstad. We also have filmmakers and photographers who are documenting the day, and the images will be used at the later stage when we inform about our anniversary and our activities. So now we will hear more about the history of central banking and the lessons we might draw from that. Uh, so please, I welcome the authors up to the podium. will be presented by Justin of Jocknik, first deputy governor of Sveriges Riksbank, who will chair this session. So, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to open this uh, panel and at the same time launch our un anniversary book, Sveriges Riksbank and the History of Central Banking. I hope you have all received the very nice book and uh, I uh, hope that you have seen that there is the, uh, the photo on the front is the first Riksbank building in the old town. And on the back you will find a photo of the 22 authors of our book, so that's fantastic. Uh, but I can promise you that it's much more than a nice uh, front and a back cover. Uh, here in, you, in the book you will find quite a lot of interesting reading. Uh, it is perspectives, new perspectives on old institutions like the Riksbank and the Bank of England. But you will also find the first time portraits of new institutions like the People's Bank of China and the European Central Bank. So uh, why did we then decide to issue a book? Uh, I think the historical perspective is uh, impossible to ignore when you are celebrating 350 years. So I think that was a yes, we have to, to issue a book. The question more, was more, I mean, is there a gap in the literature on central banking that we can fill? And uh, we found that there may be a book about individual, the history of individual central banks in several countries worldwide would be an interesting book and would fill also a, a gap that we couldn't find uh, in the literature. So uh, this was the background, and uh, we have also uh, made sure that uh, we hope that the book can also be used at the university courses. There will be a paperback version from the university, uh, Cambridge University uh, Press available. Today I uh, thought that I would have uh, six offers to the book uh, here, but now they are just five, but uh, you are all very welcome here. And it is um, five of the 22 authors in the book, and they have all an outstanding knowledge in the central bank history and also in all the different issues that we are discussing uh, today as central bankers. I will start introducing Michael Bordo. Michael is a Board of Governors Professor of Economics at the Rutgers University and the director of the Center for Monetary and Financial Center uh, History there. Michael has published widely on monetary economics and monetary history, and he is the editor of a series of books for Cambridge University Press, studies in macroeconomic history, which also includes the new book. Uh, I have also Klaus Fregat here. Fregat uh, is an associate professor of economics at Lund University. His research interest is in the interaction between macroeconomic regimes and the institutional structure of the economy, for instance, the Riksbank. Uh, 
Klaus has in the past participated in several book projects and generously offered his expertise around the central bank issues. Charles Goodhart, I think well known here among the central bankers, but is an academic central banker who has alternated between the London School of Economics and the Bank of England. He has worked throughout as a specialist monetary economist, focusing on policy issues and on financial regulation, both as an academic and at the Bank of England, not least as a member of the MPC. He has, according to his own words, written more books and articles on these subjects throughout the last 60 years than any sane person would want to read. Um, and I continue then with Franklin Allen. Franklin is Professor of Finance and Economics at Imperial College London. Franklin's main areas of interest are corporate finance, asset pricing, financial innovation, comparative financial systems, and financial crisis. And China, not least. So Franklin has in the past for many years supported the Riggs Bank as a scientific advisor to the board and is currently involved in joint projects with the Riggs Bank. And Otmar Ising is currently president of the Center for Financial Studies at the Goethe University in Frankfurt am Main. His two main research topics are monetary theory and policy and international economic relations. From a background in academia, Otmar moved on to become one of Europe's most influential central banker in the last 20 years. He, has one of the, uh, he was one of the principal architects of the common European currency, and as a former chief economist and member of the board of the ECB, he developed the two-pillar approach to the monetary policy. So uh, the aim with the panel today is not that to give you a summary of the book, because I hope that you will study the book over the weekend, uh, but with maybe try to reflect a little bit on the lessons learned from the history. And uh, even if Eric's Bank is celebrating uh, our 350 years, I think we have been a real central bank just for maybe the last 100 years. So I think that is one issue that will pop up here in the different presentations. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think for most central banks, it started not with a central bank, but with a commercial bank. And then the, nar the mandates have been narrowed down for the banks. And then we have uh, suddenly had a uh, good mandates for the today's uh, well-established central banks. So I would now like to ask our panelists and authors with reference to their book chapters about their views on the more important landmarks in the history of central banks and what have been the success factors for today's well-established and seldom uh, and not seldom highly trusted central banks. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would like to invite Michael Border to start. Michael had, to get, had together with Pierre L. Ciclos written the second chapter in the book. It's about evolution and innovation in historical perspective. And you have around 10 minutes, and I will give you a sign uh, if uh, you will not keep me in the timeline. So please. paper with Pierre Ciclos, who comes from Canada, where I also come from, uh, examines the evolution of central banks in historical context. Uh, we focus on how central banks learn from each other over time in an evolving network of, of central banks. The approach we took combines historical narrative with empirical methods. We look at the history of 10 advanced countries, central banks, over close to 300 years um, across varying exchange rate regimes. Um, our key findings are that in the 18th and 19th centuries, the Bank of England was the leader in central bank innovation. In the 20th century, it was the Federal Reserve and the Bundesbank. Since the 1980s, it has been the small open 
economies who have led in innovation. Sweden, Norway, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. So in our narrative, we describe the foundation of the first central bank, the Rix Bank, established in 1668, followed in 1694 by the Bank of England, uh, and, and, then, and then the other central banks. These, uh, these central banks, which they weren't called central banks, they were called banks of issue, they were first set up and they were private. They were first set up to be the government's fiscal agents during wartime to help them market their debt. Uh, they then, uh, because of their size and their status, uh, they evolved into, into, into what we call bankers' banks. And they would hold deposits from other commercial banks. That set the stage later for the development of the lender of last resort function. Okay. They also, in the 19th century, central banks in Europe evolved into managers of the classical gold standard. And they were supposed to follow what are called the rules of the game. And that is that means they're supposed to speed up the adjustment to shocks, international shocks, and shocks of the balance. Then in the face of, of many financial crises in the 19th century, the Bank of England, the Banque de France, and the others learned to be lenders of last resort and to follow Walter Badgett's uh, famous strictures. And then following upon the lender of last resort function, um, they learned how to become or they became custodians of the payment system. In the 20th century, after World War I, they began to stabilize the business cycle. And they be became concerned with the behavior of the price level of real output and, and, and unemployed and unemployment. And this reflected both changing political economy, the growth of labor and the, ad and the suffrage, and the advent of Keynesian doctrine. By the late 20th century, after the collapse of the Bretton Woods system and the Great Inflation, and we talk about all that stuff in great detail in the paper, uh, they learn to focus on, on credibility for low inflation. This starts in the late in 1979 with Paul Volcker. With the global financial crisis, 2007 to 2008, uh, central banks began placing uh, increased emphasis on financial stability, and that meant heading off systemic risk and especially credit-driven asset price moves. Now, this function, which we think is very much, actually, it, 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 it's, it's pretty ancient. It goes back, in fact, in the U.S. context, the Fed in the 1920s followed this, this approach. It was called the Real Bills Doctrine then. That they headed, they headed off, and it's too bad what happened, uh, the stock market led to the crash of 1929. Um, okay. So the pattern of evolution followed a pendulum. Good performance before 1914 under the gold standard, poor performance in the interwar and the Great, the great Depression and the Great Inflation. And then you get a return to good performance with the Great Moderation. And this pendulum was driven by both shocks and by changing economic doctrine. Well, then what we do in our paper, as I said, the paper combined narrative with empirics. Uh, we have pretty extensive empirical analysis, which focuses on the 10 advanced country central banks. These are Sweden, Norway, the UK, US, Germany, France, Italy, Canada, Switzerland, and Japan. So we look at these 10 countries from 1880 to 2010. We have annual data on prices and output and a lot of other macroeconomic variables. And we break this sample down into four exchange rate regimes, the gold standard, the interwar, Bretton Woods, and the, the managed flow. Um, and what we do is so given this empirical setup, the first thing we do is look, we look at the pattern of learning across central banks 
with respect to inflation performance. And we have all these fancy econometric stuff in there. Pierre did most of it, I should say. We, we find that in the 19th century, in fact, pre-1914, other central banks followed the lead of the Bank of England. Then we conduct a number of counterfactuals. By counterfactuals, the term historians use a sort of as-if question, what would have happened you know, if Napoleon had won at Waterloo, questions like that. Okay. We focus on the, on the experience of three countries that were late in adopting central banks. The United States, the Federal Reserve was established in 1913. Switzerland, uh, the, the SNB was established in 1907, and Canada. The Bank of Canada was established very late in 1935. So what we do is we ask, what would have happened to the behavior of, of, of prices, of inflation, and of output, both the means and the variances, if they had adopted central banks earlier? And what we found was that in most cases, not all, inflation and output performance would have actually been better if they had adopted central banks. The next thing we looked at was took a more, look at a more modern uh, period, we looked at the adoption of inflation targeting since the 1990s. And we found that the small open economies, okay, Sweden, Norway, Canada, had better inflation performance than other large countries that adopted IT 10 years later. And so the, the bottom line of our, of our, of our paper is that the history of central banks um, su suggests to us that they can be viewed as having evolved as a network, learning from each other's experience. The leader in the early years was the Bank of England, the 20th century, it's the Fed and the Bundesbank, and later, since the 1980s, it has been the small open economies, especially this one. And these these countries, the central banks of these countries, proved to be more nimble for various reasons in adopting their, the new financial technology. What we talk about is IT, but there are other things too, okay, including CDI, central bank independence, than did their larger um, counterparts. So, so the last, the second point I want to make, the second sort of bottom line point is that um, what this chapter illustrates is the importance of matching uh, historical methodology with modern empirics, empirics in understanding the evolution of central banks. Thank you. Thanks a lot for those interesting uh, thoughts and uh, studies and analysis that you have done. Uh, we continue and I would now like to invite the next panelist, Klaus Frege. Klaus is the author of the third chapter, The Riksbank, 350 years in the making. Please. Thank you. Coming here and saying something about my chapter and this uh, long history of 350 years. So I've uh, uh, speculated during my work, but also now before this panel, about what were the uh, success factors, because uh, not the whole history was a gradual progression. On the contrary, it's a very dramatic 350 years with uh, success abuse of different kinds, even irrelevance during certain periods. Uh, but. Uh, what are the common factors when it's gone uh, well? Uh, so that's interesting to, to uh, look, look back, uh, having uh, gone through uh, much detail uh, about this. So the first factor, and I think uh, uh, all macroeconomists would agree on this, that the first success factor is a commitment to a nominal anchor. And that, from the beginning, a dominant one has been convertibility to a metal. And the metal has changed over time. Uh, and that was also in the original charter, that this was self-evident, that it should be creating deposits convertible to uh, some form of metal. Uh, 
So, uh, how does it play out in the Swedish history? Well, so I uh, made a list here of uh, the successful periods defined with, with only price stability as the goal, and there also the financial stability. I will not take up that. My general impression is that Sweden has been fairly spared large crisis. We've had crisis, but I, I will not talk about that. But uh, what are the success periods? The first uh, uh, ranked by length. The longest period of uh, stability is the period 1834 to 1914, when we had a silver standard which changed to gold standard in 1873. And that's outstanding. 80 years of stable money, low inflation, some deflation, and also fairly stable yearly fluctuations. Uh, so it's a huge success. Uh, should say something about this um, period. It seems special. Uh, it's one. The beginning was special in that it, uh, it started 1834 after uh, uh, almost 25 years of fiat money and also of questioning of the Riks Bank. There were uh, at several parliamentary meetings there were discussions of privatizing uh, the Riks Bank and of course. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the example used was Bank of England, a private bank, which had a better record. The Riks Bank record was very questioned, and I will not go into that, the 18th century, and, and uh, it was not successful at, at all, uh, the 18th century. So it started with that, but that also meant that the Riks Bank, which at that time was independent of the executive, we had a constitution, with separation between king and parliament, and the parliament and the banking committee took it very seriously, meaning that they gave very detailed instructions at the parliamentary meetings, and then in between, the, the governing council had to follow these very detailed instructions, what to do in general about the note issue, but also how to behave in crisis and so on. Very detailed scheme that lasted for a long time. So that worked. One observation here is 1834-1914. That's when Sweden got a modern financial uh, sector. We hardly had anything outside the Riksbank before that, a little bit, but not much. And uh, the Riksbank was the main commercial bank, but it was almost put out of business during the 19th century. It was even almost lost the note issue because of private note issuing banks, but it came back. And in the end, it became a modern central bank. But it took quite a long time, not until uh, 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 1890s, so we were way behind several other central banks. But it's notable that this commitment to convertibility and price stability, that worked, and it worked through these tremendous structural changes of the whole economy. So maybe that uh, uh, focus on convertibility also helped to deal with these uh, huge changes. Uh, the second, second successful period is actually the last one, the inflation target. If we start with 93, it's 25 years of success. Uh, Director Skingsley here in the morning said somewhat modestly that it's not that long period compared to 350 years, but actually it's the second best, as I rated, period in the 350 year history. So you, those of you here should be proud of being part of that uh, success story. And uh, uh, so that's the second. Uh, Period. The third period is the Bretton Woods fixed exchange rate period. Sweden was a member between 1951 71, also stable, successful period on the whole. And then we have we mentioned this morning, we had this uh, uh, interesting episode of declared price stabilization after we left the gold standard in 1931. Actually, that period was not very long lived. Uh, we, we had a floating exchange rate for one and a half year, then it was fixed. And that didn't contrast with the, contradict the price stability of the gold. But at the end of the 1930s, the gold was go gone, and uh, uh, the reason behind that was at that time the Riks Bank and the Governing Council was not independent. That uh, actually the finance minister, big force, overruled uh, uh, price uh, stabilization in, in the end, end. So that's an interesting case in this discussion. So this is the first factor, commitment to nominal anchor, important, and, and Sweden is a very good example of that. The second 
success factors. How many minutes? Uh, you have five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. Thank you. Good. Uh, second success factor, I think also most would agree to that, that we have fiscal stability. Uh, all the really bad periods in the history of the Riksbank in terms of, of uh, unstable prices have been caused by uh, the government borrowing at the Riksbank. And that started uh, at small scale, uh, uh, well actually the first borrowing occurred in the 1670s by King Charles XI. He had actually made a royal so-called assurance when he was inaugurated not to borrow from the Riksbank be the situation as hard as possible. But he did, but he paid back actually his, that, that war. But from the 1700s we have had several periods with large-scale borrowing and that had threatened uh, convertibility and thereby also price stability. So that's very clear. And we also have the period before inflation targeting the 1971 to 92 period with repeated devaluations. We had a wage price devaluation cycles and very uh, erratic outcome in terms of price stability. And behind that was uh, 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 loose fiscal policy and, and the too ambitious uh, stabilization policy, which was not compatible with the fixed exchange rate. So convertibility was broken, but behind it was, as I said, the uh, 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 lack of fiscal stability. Of course, we should also mention that after inflation targeting was started in 93, we also had a complete change of fiscal policy with the new budget law in 96, and so we have a, a major regime change, monetary and fiscal, after 93, and they support each other. So that's one, I think, important factor for the future to consider that that, uh, that that's the whole situation has changed. Okay, uh, my last point is um, legal independence. Is it important uh, for central bank uh, behavior? Well, broadly, Swedish history shows that legal independence is not a sufficient condition because the laws have been broken at several times. Especially during wars and crises, laws are broken. So, uh, uh, But there is no guarantee, at least if you look at historically, of course, we have these sporty kings and so on that we have got rid of, so that threat is, is gone. But it's an observation that, that um, it's not a sufficient condition. Then one could ask, that's my last point, is the legislation of an independent central bank to carry out its, its stability goal, is it a necessary condition? Well, then I look for, are there successful periods where the Riksbank was dependent? Well, there are two candidates, but perhaps they can be discussed. We have the Bretton Woods period with a dependent Riksbank, but we had a good outcome. We have the inflation targeting regime, 93 to 99 before the new law, also with a good outcome. But you could argue that both periods you had de facto independence. In the Bretton Woods period, you had not uh, legal uh, uh, restrictions, but we had the restriction of the Bretton Woods agreement that worked like this general restriction that helped convertibility into dollars and, and so. So uh, I think, yeah, the current law is it's a good, necessary condition, but I cannot say it's sufficient, unfortunately. It would be nice to say that it would be sufficient with the law from 99, but history cannot prove that uh, point. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Klaus. It's uh, for your nice perspectives on the uh, Swedish Central Bank, and we will have a possibility to discuss, discuss this more later on. I would now also like to uh, welcome Barry Eichen Green. You came in time here, but before it's your turn, I now turn and invite uh, Charles Goodhart to, uh, you have written the chapter about the Bank of England, 1694 to 2017, please. Uh, thank you very much. I, it's good that I come immediately after the Riggs Bank because in fact we have a lot in common. Uh, we are undoubtedly by far the two oldest functioning uh, central banks. And our closest relationship and chief client has always been the government.
relationships with government have always been important and central uh, to the work of central banks. Uh, in both cases, as Class was just indicating, there have been several twists and turns in central banks' relationships with government. In the case of the old lady of Needle Street, initially it was independent with certain qualifications. First, when there was a real crisis, for example, as occurred when we had to suspend the gold standard, uh, the central bank, the Bank of England, has to work very closely with the government. Okay? Okay. Can you hear? Can you hear now? Okay. Um, the there have been a number of phases uh, of that relationship in the case of the Bank of England. Uh, from the outset until World War I, uh, the bank was largely independent with qualifications. The first qualification being in the case of serious crises. The second qualification being that the bank always had certain public duties to uphold, uh, particularly except during the suspension, to try to maintain the gold standard, because the bank, like the Riggs Bank, as class was indicating, has always had a focus and concentration on the right to maintain uh, price stability. Then, from World War I until the 1990s, uh, the bank became largely subservient to the oversight of the Chancellor and the Treasury. The bank was an advisor, uh, an expert, uh, but the key decisions were made uh, by the politicians. And now we're back with a degree of operational independence, with a flexible inflation target, where the level of the target is actually set for the bank by the Chancellor. Now, whether this represents the end of history will be for the next generation to discover. Now, where the Bank of England undoubtedly did precede the Riggs Bank uh, was in its relationship with the commercial banks. Uh, as Class was indicating, uh, the Riggs Bank didn't really become the banker's bank in Sweden until the beginning of the 20th century, as I recall. Whereas the Bank of England uh, became the banker's bank uh, quite early on uh, and was such by the end of the 18th century. As banker to the banks, uh, it naturally also had the requirement of acting as lender of last resort. Indeed, that phrase was coined by Sir Francis Baring as early as 1797. But how does a central bank know when and how it should use its lender of last resort powers? Bank of England has actually always been blessed, or rather the UK has always been blessed, uh, by a number of really brilliant thinkers uh, about monetary policy and monetary affairs. Uh, and always, of course, accepting the current and present company uh, the most notable of these thinkers, uh, in my view, were Henry Thornton and Walter Badgett. And although Walter Badgett is more frequently uh, quoted, Henry Thornton was actually the much more profound thinker and earlier. It was actually a scandal that Badgett never, never quoted Henry Thornton in, in his own book on Lombard Street. I would just like to add that besides the importance and range of the monetary economists in the UK, we share this with Sweden, because for a relatively small population, uh, you too have developed more really high level monetary thinkers and monetary economists than, it, than is by far your fair share. Um, you, have, you are really quite remarkable uh, in, in that respect. Now, the 
question of whether and how you should act as lender of last resort did not, during the years in which this was being developed, depend in any way on direct supervision uh, of the commercial banks by the Bank of England. Indeed, the Bank of England could not do that because it was a competitor with the commercial banks at the same time, at least up to a point. So that the way, the main way that the Bank of England uh, actually decided whether to undertake a lender of last resort or not depended on its assessment of the quality of the paper that was being put forward. The Bank of England was always particularly concerned with the quality of paper going through its own money markets. You will recall that until the 1930s, uh, as Michael was indicating, the real bills doctrine Old sway. And I would just note that Mervyn King in his recent uh, paper has suggested getting back towards a version where lender of last resort activities depend primarily on the pre-positioning of collateral. As I earlier said, the bank could hardly have become a direct supervisor of the commercial banks prior to the beginning of the 20th century because it also ran its own, albeit somewhat limited, commercial business. It was the central bank's withdrawal from direct competition with commercial banks' deposit and lending business that paved the way for its greater supervisory and regulatory role. I must confess to having some concern about the question of whether uh, central banks entering into the digital currency business uh, might have or reverse in some way the implicit concordat that the central bank does not compete directly with the commercial banks. And that too, the supervisory and regulatory relationship between the central bank and the commercial banks, like its relationship with government, has gone through numerous twists and turns in recent decades. And the relative role of the central bank, uh, the Treasury or Ministry of Finance, and maybe an independent body in the achievement of financial stability remains the most debatable and uncertain issue that remains within the field of central banking. Thanks a lot for your thoughtful presentation. Uh, I would now like to uh, introduce Barry Eichengreen. Uh, Barry is a professor of economics and political science at Berkeley and has done research and policy analysis and published widely on the history and current operation of the international monetary and financial system. Uh, in the, the Swedes in the audience surely recognize that Barry is a regular contributor to the Swedish newspaper Dagens Nyheter on current issues. So uh, I would now like to invite you to uh, make your presentation. You have written the 11th chapter in the book and it's the two uh, eras of central banking in the United States. Please. Thank you very much. Let me um, apologize for my late arrival and add my voice of congratulations to, to the Riksbank. It's uh, appropriate that my chapter on, on, on the Federal Reserve System in the United States comes third in chronological order after, after uh, the presentations on the Riksbank and the uh, uh, Bank of England. We do, while the Federal Reserve is barely 100 years old, we do have a longer uh, checkered history of central banking in the country, stretching back uh, 200 and, and more years. And, and it's about that longer history and the uh, surrounding political economy that I, that I want to speak for a few minutes. As everybody in this room will know, central bank decisions are, are always controversial. In the United States, uh, this controversy is shaped by a distinctive set of national characteristics and uh, a distinctive national history that create enduring tensions for uh, monetary policymakers. 
there has always been a tension between uh, the rights and prerogatives uh, of the individual states on the one hand and the federal government on the other, something that has prompted uh, enduring opposition to a federal institution with wide-ranging monetary powers. There have always been sectional divisions uh, in the United States between North and South, between uh, agricultural and industrial regions, between uh, flyover states uh, and the coasts. Uh, these are also a, a, a fact of American life and long have been. Deep-seated suspicion of concentrated financial power, uh, concentrated financial power with which uh, central bankers are perceived to be uh, alive is another intrinsic feature of American political culture. A uh, significant se segment of the voting uh, public is temperamentally opposed to government expansion in all its forms uh, and sees the central bank as uh, fiscal agent and financier to the government. It sees the central bank as an agent of such expansion. At the same time, the majority of economists and Perhaps uh, a majority of Americans would acknowledge that with uh, time and with changes in the structure of the economy, the case for a central bank has become more compelling. Uh, financial markets have grown more complex. Simple rules for ensuring price and economic stability without a central bank, those of the 19th century gold standard, for example, are no longer workable. International agreements to stabilize exchange rates like those uh, uh, of the Bretton Woods system, uh, as we've heard, have become more difficult to negotiate, much less uh, to sustain in a, in a modern multipolar world no longer dominated by uh, a, a single country or, or a cohesive group of countries. Expedients like a unilateral peg to another currency, such as that uh, adopted by Hong Kong are not available to a country as large as the United States. And even economies like Hong Kong, uh, which have put monetary policy on autopilot, have not been able to do away with a monetary authority, uh, given uh, the expanding portfolio of responsibilities uh, that such uh, an authority is now, now entrusted with, microprudential supervision, in, in most cases macroprudential supervision. Uh, and acting as trusted advisor to the government. So if you put these two perspectives uh, together, it immediately becomes clear why central banking in the United States has always entailed compromises. Uh, those compromises were evident in the hybrid public-private structure of the first and second banks uh, of the United States. They were evident in the decentralized nature of the Federal Reserve System as it was uh, uh, established in 1913. And the unsatisfactory nature of those compromises was manifested in first the, the decisions to allow the charters of the first and second banks of the United States to lapse, and then uh, the decision in 1935 to centralize decision making uh, in, in the hands of the Board of Governors, uh, the Federal Open Market Committee, and Washington, D.C. Critics continue to challenge the resulting compromises. Uh, they, we have an ongoing, endless debate in the, in the United States uh, where uh, further changes to, to the uh, Federal Reserve Act and the operations uh, of the Fed are proposed. Those uh, proposals have only one characteristic in common, uh, namely that they're viewed as undesirable by officials of the Federal Reserve System itself. The legitimacy of uh, an institution like uh, a central bank uh, ultimately rests on two sources. Um, the, the first one is input legitimacy. Acceptance uh, uh, of the institution derives from the process through which decisions uh, are reached and power is exercised. If that process gives voice to and empowers the relevant stakeholders,